Okay, so I am trying a new series of videos here that should finish off every playlist with a bit of a summary, a bit of revision, and to try and do a few questions that will kind of get you up to speed, ready to go and have a look at some exam questions. So I would recommend doing this as a bit of revision or just to kind of finish off the playlist. And we're going to start off with chapter one from Pure Year One, the AS chapter, which is algebraic expressions. And the first aspect of this is index laws. So you might want to pause the video and make sure you know these index laws here, but I'm going to begin by filling these in. So we have a to the power of m times a to the power of n. Well, we know what to do for that one. We just simply add the powers so that we get a to the power of m plus n. This one where we're dividing, we subtract the powers. So that's m minus n. When you have brackets, we know that we're multiplying the powers. So that's a to the power of mn. And then this is one that's a little bit more niche, not covered that much at GCSE. When you have two things being multiplied all to a power, the power applies to each part of them separately. And it's worth knowing that this one can go in reverse. Obviously, all of these can go in reverse if you do need to kind of go backwards in these identities or in these, um, these rules that we've got here, I should say. And then this one, when we have it as a fraction, it means that we're going to be taking a root. And in this case, it would be the nth root of a like this. So if it was, I don't know, one over two, it'd be the square root, one over three, it would be the cube root. And then last of all, if we have a negative power, we know that that means to take the reciprocal. So we'll kind of flip it as a one over, and then it becomes a positive version of the power. Now the stuff in the exercises in the textbook, pretty straightforward. So I've got two more challenging questions here that should kind of get you built up, ready for looking at exam questions in this topic. And the first one we're going to do on index laws is going to be to take this expression that we've got down here, and we want to write it in the form 2 to the power of a times 3 to the power of b. We need to find out what a and b are. So I'd probably recommend pausing the video and having a go, or if you're watching this for a vision, you can just zoom through and watch me doing it. So I think the issue here is that we've got some numbers that aren't two or three. We've got six and we've got 12, which we're going to need to kind of manipulate into that form. So I'm going to keep the two cubed, which is obviously still there. And I think what I'm going to do now is work on the next part, which is my three times by the square root of six. Now, the square root of six, I could write this as six to the power of a half. But instead, I'm going to write it as a two times three to the power of a half like this. And then for the next part, I've got my 3 squared, and that's going to divide by my 2 cubed square rooted. So that's going to be 2 cubed, and we know that square root means to the power of a half, so I'm going to write it like this. And then for my last part, for 12, you've got to think, how can you do 12 as 2 and 3? Well, 12 is 3 times 4, so I could write it as 3 times 4. Or I suppose I could write it, therefore, as 3 times 2 squared. Obviously, if you started off and you wrote it as 2 times 6, well, you're going to need to break that 6 down into a 2 and a 3. And that would still give you this expression at the bottom of the 3 times 2 squared. So we're going to have it being multiplied by a 3 and a 2 squared. So the first thing I've done is I've got it all in terms of 3s and 2s. Now I'm going to keep processing with some of these laws that we've got. And I think this one here that we have this six square rooted, I'm gonna use this law that we have over here to apply that half to each part separately. So I'm gonna begin, I'll keep my two cubed. I'm gonna then have my three, which has actually got a power of one. I then have a two to the power of a half and a three to the power of a half. And then for the next part, I've got my three squared. On the bottom here, that law means we multiply these. So that's two to the power of three over two. I've got another 3 to the power of 1, and then I have a 2 squared. So now it's as simple as just collecting the 2s together. So here are my two terms that we've got like this. And then my next part is going to be to gather the 3 terms, which are over here. So for the 2 part, I have my 2 cubed, 2 to the power of a half, and 2 squared. So all of those parts are going to add together. So that's going to be a 3 plus 2, that's 5. 5 plus a half, well that's 5 and a half. If you want to, you could write it as 2 to the power of 5 and a half, but 5 and a half we know is 11 over 2. So that's 2 to the power of 11 over 2, and it's being divided by 2 to the power of 3 over 2. So that's all of the 2s done. And then that's being multiplied by a 3 to the power of 1, a half, a 2, and a 1. So that's 1 and a half, 2 and a half, 3 and a half, 4 and a half. So that's 3 to the power of 4 and a half, 3 to the power of 4 and a half, is 9 over 2. 4.5 is 9 over 2. So my last stage is just to sort this out where I'm going to be subtracting them. So 11 over 2 minus 3 over 2. 11 minus 3, that's 8. So it's 8 over 2, which is 4. So it's 2 to the power of 4 multiplied by 3 to the power of 9 over 2. So we've got that the a value was 4 
and the B value was nine over two. A little bit more challenging than the previous sorts of questions you might have done in the textbook for this. Okay, we're also going to try this one over here, which asks us to take this equation that we've got here and to express y in terms of x. Now, this looks a bit confusing. There looks like an awful lot of stuff going on here. But the key theme that I want you to notice is that we've got a square root of 2, a 16, and a 32. And we think, how do all of these connect together? Well, they're all to do with the base of 2. So we know that we have 2 squared is 4. We know that 2 cubed is 8. 2 to the power of 4 is 16, and 2 to the power of 5 is 32. So the trick in this question is going to take this 16 and this 32 and rewrite them with a base of 2. Because if we write them with a base of 2, we should be able to kind of just compare all of the powers. So I'll start off with this. This 16 I'm going to rewrite as 2 to the power of 4, and that whole thing has a power of 2x minus 3. And then on the denominator, I have a square root of 2, which is 2 to the power of a half. So that's 2 to the power of a half, all to the power of y plus 3. And on the right-hand side, we have 2 to the power of 5, because that's what 32 is, 2 to the power of 5. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. Now I'm going to use this law. I'm going to use the a to the m to the power of n. So I'm going to multiply these and multiply by these. If you want to, you could multiply this up all onto this side, but it's not actually going to be necessary. So if I multiply the 4 by the 2x minus 3, I get 2 to the power of 8x minus 12. And on the bottom, I get 2 to the power of, and it looks a bit weird, but it's okay to do, that's a half y plus 3 over 2. And that's equal to 2 to the power of 5. Now my aim is going to just be to have a 2 to the power of something and a 2 to the power of 5. So I can therefore say that the power parts must be equal. So I guess my last step now is to sort out these, which is a subtract. So when we do it with the subtract, we're going to have our 8x minus 12. And I'm subtracting this entire thing. So you need to subtract this and you need to sub subtract this. So it's going to be subtracting a half y and it's going to be subtracting 3 over 2. And that is equal to 2 to the power of 5. Now we've got to this stage where they both just have a base of 2. Clearly, this must be equal to this. So I can actually now ignore the, the, the two parts and I can just look at the green part and I can say that 8x minus 12 minus a half y minus 3 over 2 must be equal to 5. And we're just going to remind ourselves what the question said. It says express y in terms of x. So I just need to make y the subject of this. I'm going to put this y, half y to the other side and I'll put this 5 over here. So we get 8x minus 12 minus 3 over 2 minus 5. So I've subtracted the 5 and I'm going to add the half y to this side. Of course, I could just put this on a calculator and then double it. I'm going to be a bit lazy and not use my calculator at all. I'm now going to multiply everything by 2 to make y the subject so that I get 16x minus 24 minus 3 minus 10 is equal to y. So my final answer is that y is 16x and 24, minus 24 minus 3 minus 10, that is minus 37. So y is equal to 16x minus 37. And this is the kind of thing you might expect to see in an AS question. And it might be some skills that you have to use throughout the rest of Pure in year one and in year two. Okay, so after index laws, we'll do some stuff on expanding and factorizing, but not too much on this because really it should feel quite familiar with stuff from GCSE. So the first thing I want to look at is this bit over here, a, rem a reminder of the difference of two squares. So think to yourself what this should be. It is going to be an a minus b and an a plus b. Difference of two squares is very, very common. I always write it as difference of two squares dots. You might see that coming up in some future videos as well. So I don't need difference of two squares for this first one, but I'm going to expand and simplify this part that we've got. So I'm going to begin by going a little bit more slowly with this because it's a, a perhaps a bit of a trickier one than something from GCSE. And I'm going to begin by multiplying everything by this root x term. So I'm going to do this one and I'll do this one. So I have the square root of xy multiplied by the square root of x. And then the next one is going to be a square root of y and a square root of x. I'm probably going to write it in alphabetical order. So I have the square root of x and the square root of y. Now for the next part, I will do these ones multiplied. So I will do the first one with the last one, and then I will do this one with this one, whichever order you do it in. As long as you have all of them being multiplied together, it will be fine. So I will have my, the square root of xy times the square root of xy, square root of xy times the square root of xy. 
And then my last one I have is my square root of y times my square root of x, y. And we just need to be a bit careful about how we simplify these things. So this, this is actually a square root of x and a square root of y. It's an application of that index law from before. So I have a square root of x and a square root of x, which is going to make just an x, and I still have the square root of y. This one, two square roots being multiplied together, you'll see it on the next page with thirds. We can just write that as the square root of x, y. They can combine together. The square root of x, y times the square root of x, y, by definition, is just going to be x, y. And then my last one here, I have a square root of y, there's a square root of y in here, and a square root of y times the square root of y is just a y, and then I will have my square root of x. Now, if you wrote this one here as the square root of x and then y, that would be okay, but the reason we don't do that is because it sometimes looks like the y is inside, so you should either close it off like this to make it clear, or just put the y outside the front so that it's really, really obvious like this, okay? And the bit that I did here, these were from the red section that we had on the bottom. Okay, let's have a quick look at these factorizing questions. It does say factorize fully, so you have to go all the way with factorizing these as much as possible. Well, this looks like a great example of a difference of two squares here. So I will do, using the law that we had up at the top, the a minus b and the a plus b, I will start off by doing this as an x squared minus y squared, and then an x squared plus y squared. Now, if you stopped here, you didn't do the fully part because this can also factorize. It's another difference of two squares. So there's going to be an x minus y, an x plus y, and then we've got our x squared plus y squared. And that one can't factorize because it's not a difference. It's got a, a sum instead of a difference there. Okay, so we're going to do this one. The first thing to do in factorizing is always just see is there a common factor. And there is. It's an x. So there's an x minus 100x squared. And then you think, can I factorize this? And yes, we can factorize again. We can factorize using a difference of two squares. So it will be a 1 minus, take the square root of 100x squared, which is 10x. And then we will do 1 plus the 10x like this. And that cannot be factorized any further. And then this one, kind of not really taught in the textbook, but it's the kind of thing that will help you as you go throughout all of studying um, like pure stuff for maths. And if you're doing further maths especially. Now, if you wanted to factorize this, you could go in a quite long way. You could have your x plus 1, and then you could expand this bracket to get an x squared plus 2x plus 1. And then you could put all that of that back together. But I wanted to teach you a different kind of technique for this. So let's actually just pretend for a second. I'm going to just let a be equal to x plus 1. If we did that, we would have a plus a squared. And that's really easy to factorize, isn't it? Because it would just be an a 1 plus a. Now, all you need to do is just not have to use this substitution. You just need to say, okay, well, this thing, this x plus 1, I'm going to treat it just as something by itself. And I'm going to put that outside the front as the thing that they have in common. So x plus 1, what do I need to multiply it by to get an x plus 1? It is a 1, this 1 that we have right here. And then I think to myself, what do I need to multiply this x plus 1 by to get this x plus 1 squared? Well, it needs to be multiplied by another x plus 1. And you know what? It doesn't really need those brackets around it, does it? It's just needing to be multiplied by an x plus 1. So simplifying all of that, I just get x plus 1. And then x plus 1 plus 1 is x plus 2. And we end up with this expression. And look how it's really similar to this one that we did down here. I have the a, which is the x plus 1, and then the 1 plus a, which is 1 greater than the x plus 1, which is x plus 2. So just a bit of an interesting factorizing technique there, that it doesn't always have to be a single thing that is pulled out to the front. You can actually pull out a bracket as long as they have that thing in common. Okay, and we'll finish off with some stuff with SIRDS. SIRDS is in GCSE, so you should feel pretty familiar with this. But I'm going to just very quickly talk to you about rationalizing. So to rationalize the denominator, you multiply the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate of the denominator here. So in this case, I'm going to be multiplying it by an a, let's go to my thinner pen, a minus the square root of b divided by a minus the square root of b. And this doesn't actually change the size of this because whatever this is and whatever this is, they're the same. So it's 1. And we know when you multiply by 1, nothing changes. So that's how we rationalize the denominator. It means that the denominator becomes a number that doesn't have a third in. 
And we used these laws earlier on, but just to kind of have them as a summary of this chapter, if you have the square root of AB, that's the same as the square root of A multiplied by the square root of B. I think we had that earlier on. We had the square root of XY, and that was the same as the square root of X, the square root of Y. You don't actually need that multiply symbol in there. And this one, it's the same as doing the square root of A divided by the square root of B. And again, you can use these laws in both directions. So we're going to just do this question here, and it is a show that this thing is equal to this. And I know what you're thinking. You're probably just like, well, if I saw this, I would just type it in my calculator and it would give me this thing right away. And this is where I want to draw your attention to this exam tip that we've got down here. So I've said from now on, if a question ever says show that, and as part of the method within that question, you need to rationalize a denominator, there is a mark reserved for showing this process. Even if you just show this part over here and then still put it in your calculator, this process of showing it is reserved. Uh, there's one mark reserved for it. And I dropped a mark in one of my exams where I think I only dropped one or two marks. And one of them was for this. So don't do what I did. If it ever says show that, make sure you show the entire process. So I'm going to go through this one nice and quick. Hopefully you've tried this one yourself. So we have our three plus root five. Now I actually can't do the rationalizing process until I have expanded the brackets on the denominator. So I probably would do this somewhere else. I have my two plus root five squared, which is another two plus root five being multiplied by it. So the two times two is a four. I then get a two root five. I get a, another two root five, and then I get a root five times root five, which is just a five. So that gives me a nine plus four root five. So the denominator is a nine plus four root five. Now I actually do need to show this process, even if I were to put it in my calculator afterwards, um, to show that question. So I need to multiply by the conjugate, which is nine minus four root five and a nine minus four root five like this. Now I like to put brackets around here and here, simply because it reminds me to do like double bracket expansion rather than just multiplying this by it. it needs to do the whole thing so for the numerator i'll have the three times the nine which is the 27 and the three times the minus four root five which is minus 12 root five i have the root five times the nine which is obviously a nine root five and then this is maybe the trickier part i have a root five times a minus four root five well let's just deal with the root fives that's a five and a four five times four is 20 so we get a minus 20. We just move this slightly out of the way so it doesn't look quite so busy. And then for the denominator, there is a shortcut to doing this. You can just do the 9 times 9, which is the 81. And then you would have a uh, 36 root 5 and a minus 36 root 5. So they cancel. So you just need to multiply those last two, which are going to be with a subtract. We have a root 5 and a root 5, which gives me a 5. I need to times it by a 4 and a 4. Well, 5 times 4 is 20 times it by another four is 80. So I get 81 minus 80. So the denominator is a one, which is nice and easy. The numerator is 27 take away 20, which is seven minus 12 root five plus nine root five is minus three root five. Probably don't need this line here because the denominator is a one. So we can go straight to that final answer, which is seven minus three root five, which is the thing that they wanted us to show. This step here is really important. It's also worth noting, even if you do further maths, this is still important. It was in an integration question, which is a topic you'll learn much later on. And because I didn't show this process of rationalizing the denominator in a show that question, I lost a mark. So please, 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 even if you could put it in your calculator, just show the examiner this stage here, and you could probably go straight to this line. You would probably be fine with that. Now, this is the first time I've made one of these summary videos for the end of a chapter. I would love to know what you liked about this video, what you might like to see in a future sort of ch chapter summary. Do you want there to be more recaps? Do you want there to be extra questions? What is it you like about it? Because ultimately, I want this channel to be as useful as possible for you guys. And I'll try and get through as many of these summaries as I can in the next few months so that you're sort of all prepped and ready for any kind of quick revision that you might need for your tests in school or mock exams and things like that. Anyway, guys, wishing you the best of luck, and I hope to see you in another video soon.